Welcome back. You've all been begging for it, so I'm here with you tonight to drop some knowledge on another batshit crazy cult. Yep, tonight we're talking about Scientology. I think I first heard about Scientology when I was probably around 14 years old watching a VH1 documentary about Tom Cruise, who, if you didn't know, is an extremely devout Scientologist. <laughs> Mm, yeah. <laughs> Up until this video, I made my own ignorant assumptions about Scientology based on mostly hearsay and little to no research. I regarded Scientology as a sort of popular kids club. Maybe a religion created by the elite for the elite so they could worship together and feel more enlightened and entitled than the rest of us peasants. I know now that I was mostly wrong. Let's start with the basic theology of Scientology. 75 million years ago, there was a tyrannical galactic overlord, and his name was Xenu, with an X, not a Z, in case you were wondering. Apparently, our world began when Xenu, feeling that he was going to lose his power, kidnapped his people and froze them to extract their souls. He then had them boarded onto space planes, which are said to look very similar to DC-8 planes. They were then flown to a little planet called Tiganak, which we now know as Earth. The people were deposited at the bases of volcanoes on Earth's surface, and hydrogen bombs were dropped on top of them. Then the souls, which are called Thetans in Scientology, were removed from the bodies and taken to what is basically an IMAX theater and were forced to watch 3D movies for exactly 36 days. This experience implanted the idea of Jesus Christ and Christianity into the minds of the Thetans. After this experience, each soul, each Thetan, had lost their individuality and identity and therefore began flocking together in groups of hundreds and sometimes thousands of Thetans. So today, each and every one of us is inhabited by multiple Thetans, like dozens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of Thetans, these lost souls that are kind of fighting inside of all of us to gain control of our bodies. Scientology claims that it's at the fault of these Thetans that we all suffer from chronic illness, diseases, and mental illness. It's said that by applying the teachings and therapy that the church offers, we can put to rest these warring thetans and discover our true self. The discovery of one's true self is a process that Scientology has named going clear. The goal presented by Scientology is one that focuses on a global harmony by converting others and assisting them on their journey to become clear. A clear world is a world without envy, sickness, or violence. So essentially, Scientology is going to save the world. Now I bet I know what you're thinking. Aside from the crazy ancient alien theory, this religion really doesn't sound that bad. Well, my apologies, John Travolta, but we haven't even scratched the surface of the corruption and abuse lying dormant inside these periwinkle towers. Let's go back to the beginning. Scientology was created by a man born in 1911 by the name of Lafayette Ronald Hubbard. Today he's known as science fiction novelist L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard was reportedly a bright young man in his youth with an affinity for telling stories. He attended George Washington University as an engineering major until he was placed on academic probation after failing several of his classes. He later dropped out, though the Church of Scientology now denies this fact. He joined the U.S. Navy and was made a lieutenant. Later in life, he would claim that he braved many hardships such as losing his eyesight and then later curing himself by the use of practices he would later incorporate into Scientology. He also claimed that on May 18, 1943, he led the charge in sinking a Japanese military vessel. The reality of this instance is quite different than Hubbard's account. According to government record, he claimed to his crew that he had spotted an enemy ship and ordered that they fire upon it. But no such ship was there, and the whole incident, aside from wasting precious ammunition, actually caused injury to several of Hubbard's crewmen. As for the blindness, he mentioned, the only record ailment during his military career was a case of pink eye and a stomach ulcer. Well, someone's a little dramatic. 
Hubbard was eventually discharged from the military for his erratic behavior and other shenanigans. He then moved to Pasadena, California and joined a secret society, the Order Templar Orientis. This was a secret society headed up by none other than Aleister Crowley, a British black magician. Yep, I'm serious. I'm going to do a video on the Order Templar Orientis. It's a secret society directly inspired by the esoteric knowledge allegedly discovered by the Knights Templar in the Dark Ages, which we've talked about before. I'm not going to talk too much about Aleister Crowley in this video, but to just kind of sum it up so you all get it, it's a satanic cult with heavy psychedelic drug use. Cool. It was during this period, presumably, that Hubbard began his work on his best-selling novel, Dianetics. Dianetics was a smash hit self-help novel regarding a system of psychotherapy that Hubbard invented on his own with no medical training to speak of. The most important thing to understand about Dianetics is Hubbard's idea of removing past trauma and negative memories to cure psychological and mood disorders. This method of counseling in Scientology is referred to as auditing. Auditing is a process which includes a patient or a subject, an auditor, and a device called an e-meter. An e-meter is basically a poor man's lie detector machine. It works like this. The auditor asks multiple questions of the subject and waits for a spike in the dial. The point is to pry into the dark memories of the subject and elicit a reaction to relieve the patient of whatever negative attributes they might possess. So with the success of Dianetics, Hubbard began sort of holding these auditing seminars to teach people the methods, and he charged a fee for them. But that was shut down really, really quickly by authorities because Dianetics was called a pseudoscience, and nobody involved in teaching really had a medical license, so yeah. Hubbard attempted to rename the program and was sued a second time, resulting in Hubbard losing his rights to Dianetics altogether. Hubbard decided that the only way he could make money with his work was to rebrand it as a religion, and that's exactly what he did. Scientology was born in 1954. Members were brought in with a personality test and then for a fee would begin auditing sessions to remove the negativity from their minds. Additional Dianetics testing and classes are requirements of membership. Auditing is a continuous process. You can think of auditing as sort of like the Catholic confessional if confessions cost you between fifty and ten thousand dollars per session. Retaining a tax exemption status has always been a struggle for Scientology. The Washington branch lost tax exemption when authorities found out that Hubbard was being paid a large amount from the church's profits. And in Australia, tax exemption was revoked because after investigating, authorities regarded Scientology as a cult and expressed concern that the required auditing sessions were potentially incorporating counterintelligence mind control techniques. Yes, that last statement at face value seems pretty out there. Somebody get me my tinfoil hat, we're going in deep. But there are some significant parallels and coincidence that connect L. Ron Hubbard and the CIA and the government mind control program MKUltra. So we're gonna head backwards in time to when we were talking about L. Ron Hubbard being in that satanic cult. I really wish I was joking right now. Hubbard's involvement with the Order Templar Orientis places him in the same circles with then OSS members. The OSS was the precursor organization to the CIA. Members of the OSS during the mid to late 1840s were studying and exploring techniques that the Nazis were using during the war, such as in Project Marionette. Project Marionette was intended to create the perfect race of humans, and a huge part of that was the use of drugs and psychological mind control. To fully understand Hubbard's potential connection to the CIA's mind control and brainwashing techniques, we need to quickly discuss the energy in the United States during the 1950s and 60s. Exploring human potential and thus hope of cultural evolution can be seen during this period through political movements such as that of the civil rights and the feminist movement. Most importantly, the invention and introduction of psychedelic drug use. Alfred Hubbard, no relation to L. Ron Hubbard, just a coincidence, also known as the Johnny Appleseed of LSD, began endorsing the use of LSD during this time, as well as claiming that the drug could be a doorway into the human mind's hidden potential. 
Al Hubbard's stance was a complete farce, however. It has been uncovered that he was a secret OSS member and along with his colleagues were exploring the potential for LSD to not unlock the human mind, but control it. You see, only a short time earlier had the U.S. pardoned and commissioned former Nazi scientists in a movement known as Project Paperclip, which was intended as a tool to unlock and harness Nazi military secrets. The Nazis had used LSD in Project Marionette. LSD was intended to control the population and create a perfect race of beings, and it was used alongside psychotherapy to wipe the human mind clean and make a subject more susceptible to suggestion. So how does all of this stuff connect L. Ron Hubbard to this spooky satanic cult? The evidence has not been easy to come by. And we can only base this theory on dozens of coincidences and parallels between what we know was happening in the OSS and CIA during the 50s and 60s and what L. Ron Hubbard was doing at the exact same time and who he was doing it with. We know that Hubbard moved to Pasadena, California after the Navy and joined the Order Templar Orientis, which at this point is worth mentioning that the OTO, we'll call it, was founded as an offshoot of the Rosicrucian Order. This ties anybody involved with the OTO to the esoteric teachings presumably found by the Knights Templar in the Dark Ages, the Freemasons, and the Illuminati, if you believe in such things. When in Pasadena, he moved in with chemist and rocket engineer Jack Parsons, where it is confirmed that Hubbard took part in black magic rituals. Jack Parsons was a devout Satanist and named himself the Antichrist, though you won't find any of that in the NASA chapters in the history books. The goal of the members of these occult organizations is generally to make connections with like-minded people and use esoteric knowledge, black magic, or what have you to gain power over others. Now I know it sounds super silly, but the thing is, L. Ron Hubbard, whether through ritual magic or not, succeeded in gaining control over literally millions of people. We know because of the Freedom of Information Act that the United States Intelligence Agency began conducting mind control experiments on human test subjects in the early 1950s, and Dianetics was released to the public in 1950. And if you think for a second that it's a coincidence that L. Ron Hubbard's curriculum incorporates the same psychotherapy and mind control techniques that were used in MKUltra, you're not paying attention. Auditing is a carbon copy of the CIA's technique called the Kubark interrogation method. When questioned about all of this, modern Scientologists deny that Hubbard had any involvement in Satanism or with the intelligence officials. But when confronted with the paper trail connecting Hubbard to Parsons, the story changes. Their story has become that L. Ron Hubbard was actually a secret agent sent to destroy Aleister Crawley and black magic cults. I don't really know which one is crazier at this point. Because of Scientology's strict rules against prescription drugs, most people don't realize how enthusiastic Hubbard was about experimenting with them. He even spiked his own son's bubblegum with hallucinogens starting from the age of 10. It's known that during the beginning, some high-level members were CIA agents. Al Putoff was an agent directly associated with government mind control and remote viewing projects, and he even publicly endorsed the use of the E-meter. Igor Swan is another spoke in the CIA wheel who is a devout Scientologist and who was involved in Project Stargate. Scientology faced many challenges in the 60s and 70s. Scientology offices were raided by the FDA, the FBI, and the IRS. However, Scientology remained a money-making machine, with its members paying large amounts of money for classes and auditing sessions. Some say that the fee charged at the time for going clear was upwards of $50,000. Today we know that it can be up to $1 million to go clear. In 1966, Hubbard stepped down as director and formed the Sea Organization. It was a fleet of three ships that sailed across the seas anywhere Hubbard wanted to go, and life for the crew was absolutely miserable. Very young children were recruited to do manual labor on the ships. Later, one of his sons, Ron Jr., claimed that the fleet was used for drug trafficking. All the while, Hubbard was losing control of his mind. He convinced his followers to apply for government positions and infiltrate the world governments to find and destroy documents pertaining to his past. This mission was called Project Snow White, and the mission was eventually found out and 11 of his followers, including Hubbard's own wife, were sentenced to prison. 
Wanted by the French and United States government for the last 10 years of his life, Hubbard was in hiding for most of that time. He disconnected from his wife in 1980 and estranged himself from his sons. During this time, he continued to manage the Church of Scientology from afar, communicating by several messengers. According to a spokesperson, during hiding, he devoted most of his time to reading and researching new ideas to do with his religion. L. Ron Hubbard died on January 24, 1986 in Creston, California. It is said that he wanted his church to be led by committee, not one single successor after his death. However, the church was quickly taken over by a man named David Miscavige. Though L. Ron Hubbard passed away from a stroke, that is not what his congregation was told. So what do you guys think? Do you think that L. Ron Hubbard just intended to make a religion with his natural enlightenment, or do you think he had some ulterior motives? What do you think about his definite connection to Satanism and potential connection to the CIA? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below if you want me to do a video on what life is like in Scientology today. Hit that like button, let me know what you guys want to see. This video is based off of research that I did myself for fun, so let's try to remember that. At the same time, let me know what you guys think in the comments below about Scientology and about any other cults that you guys know of that uh, may have a connection to it. I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to bring to the table. If you want to contact me, all the social media stuff is linked below. If you want to talk to me, the best way to do that is through my Facebook page. I respond very quickly. YouTube and Google as a company is not too keen on supporting content that goes a little bit deeper and kind of throws everybody into the conspiracy rabbit hole. But if you're interested in stuff like this, like I am, I know you guys really enjoy it. You should consider pledging maybe a dollar to my Patreon account to sort of support the research and keep this stuff coming. But even if you're not willing to support, that's totally okay. I love you just the same. Don't worry about it. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next week.